one of the sons of Zebedee came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they replied, We are able. And then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then they came to Jericho. And as he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated as we sing the Gospel of him. We will sing the first three verses of hymn number 714, O God of mercy. Uh, I <laughs>
John, the sons of Zebedee. They are the first of the disciples to be called by Jesus, a couple of guys in Jesus' closest inner circle. Sons of Thunder. It's an awesome name for a motorcycle gang or maybe even a rock band, but how about disciples that follow Jesus? Sons of Thunder. These two brothers think that it would be even better to be known as the great sons of thunder. So they walk up to Jesus one day and they say, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Are they being presumptuous? Yes. Are they out of line? I think they're a little bit out of line. You just kind of want to shake your head at the arrogance of these two disciples named the sons of thunder, James and John. Of course, maybe that's why Jesus calls them the sons of thunder. But the request that they make is really not all that surprising. Because when you believe you are the greatest, you're naturally going to make such demands. Just think for a moment of our presidential candidates seeking the nomination of their respective parties. They would not aspire to this highest office in our land if they did not believe that they were the greatest. And if you don't think that they're the greatest, well, then just ask them, and they'll tell you they are the greatest. Now, just before we get to our text today, Jesus announced his decision to go into Jerusalem, the city of power. And his disciples, James and John, the sons of thunder, they considered this a crusade for power and greatness. And they became excited about the possibilities of it. Imagine, they thought, Jesus in office, our man as the leader. And Jesus looks at these two men, and he asks them, well, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? What an incredible question. What if Jesus came to you. He looked at you in the eyes and he said to you, what do you want me to do for you? That's a powerful question to think about, isn't it? You would probably just tell Jesus about all of the things that you want out of this life. Your want to succeed at work. Your want maybe for some new toys, maybe a larger, big screen, high definition television. Maybe one of those new iPhone 6's that just came out, right? You maybe would ask Jesus for some of these things, for some of these things that you want in your life. Maybe a new computer. How about a new car? How about some help to take away your loneliness? How about some help to straighten out some of your family members? Or perhaps your want to have Jesus help a friend or even our nation. What would your response be if Jesus looked at you and asked you, what do you want me to do for you? James and John said, well, when you come into power, when you come into your glory, then make us powerful along with you. Let us sit on your right hand and on your left hand in your glory. And 
so when the other disciples, the other ten disciples, heard this, they were angry at James and John. Why were they angry at James and John? Because they probably wanted this very thing as well. This is what they wanted, too. When they got to Jericho, Jericho is a town about 18 miles outside of Jerusalem, a great crowd began to gather around Jesus, and they were all eager to join this parade of Jesus. We think of it maybe as his presidential parade or his inauguration. They assumed Jesus was about to take the seat of power, and so like James and John, they assumed there would be something in it for them. And frankly, we are all somewhere in that crowd, aren't we? We're in that crowd along with everybody else. Because we know what we want, and we are certainly happy to have Jesus help us with our personal wants. But you see, Jesus has another mission. And it's not a quest for success at all costs. He heads to Jerusalem to fulfill his mission to offer God's forgiving mercy to all people. To offer God's forgiving mercy. Most of all, for the damage that we've done with all of these constant pursuits in our lives for the things that we want. As Jesus and the large crowd were leaving Jericho, preparing to make their way to the seat of power, to Jerusalem, suddenly there was this blind beggar named Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the people around him they were telling Bartimaeus to be quiet. They were telling him to shut up. Don't stop, Jesus. Now we're finally getting somewhere with Jesus. And we're going to get the things that we want when Jesus comes into his power. So don't stop, Jesus. But this unimportant beggar just kept crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he, and he cried out loud. Have mercy on me. And it's fascinating that this is the first time in Mark's gospel that Jesus is called the Son of David, which means the Messiah. The hope for a new and a merciful kingdom to all people. And it's also fascinating that his own disciples, who were so close to Jesus, they were among the inner circle of Jesus. They could not see this, but blind Bartimaeus, he could see this. He could see this Jesus and this God who was merciful. The disciples didn't see it because they were so blinded by their own personal wants. But ironically, the blind man who needed mercy could see exactly who Jesus is. Now, I think that the next few words are among the most important in all of the Bible. If you look at this text, the next few words, the short verse, it simply says, and Jesus stood still. Might be translated, Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped. Jesus, God made human, God in the flesh, stopped. He stopped the parade into Jerusalem because at long last he hears the words of someone who doesn't want help, but someone who wants to have a merciful Savior. In the midst of the noisy clamor of all agendas that people have for Jesus, agendas for work, agendas for our children, agendas for our future, if anyone will cry out simply for
for the agenda of mercy, Jesus stops. In fact, Jesus will stop everything to come to that person. And Jesus stopped. I want you to remember that verse. And Jesus stopped. Those are words filled with hope. Jesus is not too busy to stop and to listen to you. Especially if you are asking him not for help, but for mercy. For mercy. To ask for help is to tell Jesus what your goals are, are in life and ask Jesus to help you achieve a little boost in obtaining those goals. But to ask for mercy is to place your life in the hands of a Savior and asking not for your goals to unfold in your life, but for Jesus and God's goals to unfold in your life. To ask for mercy is to realize that you need so much more than a boost. Jesus may or may not help us with our own goals or our wants, as uh, we typically find out in this life. We don't get everything that we want in this life. But we will also find out that Jesus will always stop and stand still before anyone who cries out, for mercy. So there's a difference between praying for help and praying for mercy. Maybe an illustration. My daughter Hannah has been learning to drive. So like many parents, we offer a lot of prayers for help. But this week she turns 16. She probably will obtain her driver's license. Now we pray for mercy. <laughs> That's the difference. Sorry about that, honey. <laughs> Notice that Bartimaeus doesn't ask for a few new coins. Though he could have. He could have asked for Jesus to give him some coins. But Bartimaeus was done looking for help to be a better beggar. Bartimaeus knew that he needed a new life that could only come from God. So he asked for mercy. And Jesus looked at the blind man, and you have to believe that Jesus maybe first looked over at James and John. He looked at James and John, and then he looked back at Bartimaeus. And then he asked Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? It's the same question that he asked James and John earlier, remember? The exact same question. This time, it was probably the disciples' shoulders that dropped, maybe, a little bit. But the question was as much a mercy for them, I think, as it was for Bartimaeus. Maybe James and John, the sons of thunder, maybe they finally got it. Maybe they understood when Bartimaeus responded to Jesus by saying, my teacher, let me see again. And maybe when the disciples heard that, maybe they saw Jesus for the very first time, not as someone who would just give them what they want, but maybe they were able to see Jesus as a merciful Savior. And maybe then they got it. Maybe then they got it. Maybe they got it, which is to say, maybe then they knew that Jesus was going to be with them no matter what. That he stops and that he stands still. Jesus stops and he stands 
still. And He is with you. He is with you in all of your fears. Those fears that have sent you down one road after another as you so blindly and so full of determination try to fulfill all of the things that you want in this life. Those things that have blinded you to the joy in life. Fears about your loneliness. Fears about your work. Fears about maybe your illness. Fears about your health. But to know that Jesus stops just to be with you, I think, is to finally get. It's to finally know. So what do you want Jesus to do for you? What do you want Jesus to do for you? It seems like you have two choices. Either you ask for a little help, but that will just be a disappointment eventually, because you can never get enough help and you can never achieve enough things in your life. Or you can ask for mercy and see that your Savior is with you always. <laughs>